Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Cheryl Reynolds. I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. And welcome to today's UC Ag Expert Talk on Citricola scale. I am from my home right now in Sacramento and Peter Cusina is also at his home in Richmond and he will be running the polls and troubleshooting any technical problems that might come up. And so since we're both uh, working from our homes, we're hoping that the audio will hold up okay today. Please note that the webinar is targeted to growers and pest management professionals, but master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use by homeowners. And you can see a list of the topics that we've already covered in this webinar series. And if you go to the playlist, you can view any of those uh, past webinars that we've had if you would like to um, view those again, or if there's any that you've missed and just want to watch. And also just a special thank you to the Citrus Research Board for their support of this webinar series. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell is a Citrus IPM specialist and research entomologist. And today she's speaking from the Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center. And she'll be speaking today on Citricola scale. So now Beth, I'll pass this over to you and you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, today I'm gonna to talk to you today about Citricola scale biology and management. And I think the subject is, is rather timely because as I'll talk about in years when the, we have rain and cool springs, it actually promotes Citricola scale. And we haven't seen that in a while. So it may be ending up to be a citricola scale year in citrus, so timely information. Citricola scales have a really simplistic life cycle. There are no males. The females can reproduce parthenogenically. They produce eggs. The eggs hatch into crawlers. The crawlers crawl out onto the leaves, and the, that's the first instar stage. They remain like that for many months, and then in the fall, they molt into second instars. And then the following spring, they just magically molt and turn into reproducing females. Um, each of these females can produce up to a thousand eggs, so there's not much stopping them. Um, so, very simple lifestyle. Two in stars, first in stars, second in stars, and then adults. And so they're only molting twice in their entire lifetime. And that life cycle takes an entire year. So, one generation per year. So if we look at their life cycle on an annual calendar basis, we can see that there are periods of time when there is just one stage. Like in March, April, they all become egg-laying females. April, May, June, those, they start producing the eggs which hatch into crawlers and which settle down and act as the first instar nymphs. So there's a long period of time between June and September when they are first instars. And then it isn't until September, October-ish that they start molting into those second instars. And um, that's what carries them through the winter. Interestingly, the different instars like to inhabit different parts of the tree. So the first instars are out on the leaves. And the second instars, when they first molt, are on the leaves. But as, as winter approaches, they trek backwards onto the twigs. And that's where they stay through the winter, is back inside the tree on the twigs. When they become females in the spring, they move back. They stay on the twigs, but they move down towards the leaves so that when their the eggs are laid and the crawlers hatch, the crawlers can immediately move out onto the leaves. So depending on the time of year, you look in different places for these different stages. It affects our sampling and it affects the treatments as well. So in April, right about now, these females are moving from the wood in the left picture there, to the ends of the twigs, the greenish wood, the newer wood, closer to the leaves. And they get really plump. And so in the next couple of weeks, you should be able to see those pretty easily on, on the green twigs if they're present. In May through July, they'll be laying these incredibly tiny eggs. And you can flip females over, and you can see their eggs and the crawlers underneath them. 
the crawlers move out. They're, they're producing these eggs over many weeks. And so the eggs are hatching and the crawlers are moving out gradually. One of the things we, we try and train you to do is to wait to treat the first instars until all the eggs have been hatched out. And you can tell that by flipping over these females and looking closely, that pile of white stuff there is actually shed skins from the eggs um, and the crawlers hatching from the eggs. So it's sort of what's left over of the egg shell. Um, so you can flip over females and look to see if there is any crawlers underneath them. By late July, all of the females have died and the population consists just of these first instar nymphs on leaves. The first instar nymph is the stage most susceptible to insecticides because it's soft, it's full of fluid, it's very tiny, it doesn't have the protective covering that the older instar has. And so it's just easier to kill. Also, it's out on the leaves, which is on the exterior of the tree. So you don't have to try and penetrate the leaves to get to the wood in order to kill scales. So the best time to treat is late July through August when all the scales have hatched and moved out onto the leaves. So on the left there, you see a dead female. On the right, you see the first instar nymph, a healthy one. I always say it has kind of an H pattern in it. They're, they're translucent, but you can sort of see this where the legs are and where the, the tiny eyes are. The eyes really just know uh, light or dark and probably just help it navigate upwards and downwards. In November through March, the scales are molting into the second instars on the leaves uh, in the left picture. So second instars are much more visible, much easier to see. And in like October, November-ish, they kind of do this gradually. They start molting, uh, they start moving back to the wood where they're going to spend the winter. So in the right picture is a really heavy population of second instars that have trucked off of the leaves and have moved themselves back onto the wood. And then we're back to April again. In April, the scales molt into females and produce lots and lots of sooty mold. So you often see, well, they're actually producing the honeydew, which the sooty mold grows on. So that is the time of year when you're gonna see sooty mold appear out of nowhere if you have a heavy population of citricola scale. And it will rain down onto the leaves and twigs and fruit. Um, and so that's a problem. Now, one of the things we did was run some experiments where we looked in an orchard that had different varying levels of citricola scale on the trees. And we looked in May when the citricola scales are females and we looked at how much sooty mold was produced on those trees. And you can see there's obviously a correlation between the percentage of sooty mold. The more scale you have per twig, the more sooty mold you're gonna have. And so that, that's an issue. But even a few citricola scale per twig can create a sooty mold problem. So even one per twig. We also looked at the yield of the trees the year after these females were there in the spring. So often populations get high, but you don't see the impact on the yield into, until the following year. Um, and in this particular case, the total fruit per tree declined with the number of scale, female scale per twig. Uh, so there was definitely a significant effect there. And um, this yield effect is what growers are most worried about. The city mold, for the most part, can be washed off of fruit in the packing house. So it can be dealt with. Ex there are exceptions to that rule. There are some organic growers that don't have washing available and all they have is brushing and then it becomes really difficult. But for the most part, the sooty mold can be dealt with. It's the yield of impacts which are very important. The more citricola scale you have in an orchard, the more likely you're gonna have yield loss. And that's why the threshold for tolerance for this particular insect is so low. We say that one female t per twig in the spring or a half nymph per leaf in the summer are treatable thresholds and populations can get much larger than that. One thing that's really important to do is to learn how to identify the citricola scale, whether they're alive or dead in the first instar stage, because 
you only want to be counting the live ones after a treatment. There are going to be lots of them on the leaves in some years that are dead. We don't care about the dead ones. We just care about the live ones. So up there in the upper left corner, you see the healthy Citricola scale nymph. You can tell it's healthy. You'd have to look at these with a hand lens because they are pretty tiny. Or you can angle the leaves in the light and if you're good at it and you can tell which ones are alive and which ones are dead. But in any case, a healthy one is translucent. It looks kind of um, 3D kind of puffed a little bit because it's got fluid inside it. And uh, I don't know, if you know insects, it just looks healthy. The one on the upper right is dying. It's starting to lose its translucence. It's getting crispy. It's not the same size as the other ones. Um, you can just tell that it's not healthy anymore. And the one in the lower right is, is completely dead. Those are pretty easy and obvious. I call them rice krispies because that's about what they look like. They turn brown, they, they, get, they get flattened, they just don't, they, they don't look healthy anymore. The one in the lower left is kind of a unique situation. Sometimes when you spray pesticides and there's oil mixed in with the pesticide or you're spraying oil specifically for citricola scale, it has the effect of making them look kind of puffed up and they don't quite look dead because they still look sort of liquidy or like if you, if you crushed them, they would have liquid in them, but they don't look normal either. They get kind of puffed up. So one of my recommendations is once you've applied a treatment, wait many weeks before you go back and look to see whether the treatment has been effective or not because in that interim time they'll go from uh, dying or dead due to oil treatment to that really crispy obviously dead look and then you don't have to make these decisions that um, might stymie you as to well is this one alive or is this one dead and should I count it or should I not count it it becomes really obvious so citricola scale can be a big problem in some years, but not in other years. What situation do they like? They like a really cool spring and a mild summer. That allows the females to create many eggs, maximizes egg hatch, and helps the nymphs to survive on the leaves. In the left-hand picture is a photo of a bunch of mostly healthy citricola scale first instar nymphs on a leaf. And you can see first that they're really small, second that they look like just little yellowish patches. On the right side is a situation where most of the scales on the leaf are dead. Often I tell people when you're sampling, don't grab the leaves that are on the very exterior of the tree because those are the ones that have been in the sun and often the sun will just basically bake and fry the citricola scale and kill them. You want to reach in a little bit into the, a little bit of shade to get the ones that um, are a little more protected and then you'll have a more realistic impression of what's going on. So for the last, I, I was reflecting back on when I last did a field day on citricola scale and it was actually eight years ago which in a way surprised me but in a way didn't because in the last eight years we have had significant drought and more, more significant, um, we've had heat, very high heat in the summertime, prolonged heat. And I think that has worked against citricola scale. It's increased the amount of red scale and thrips we have, but it's decreased the amount of citricola scale that we've had, um, just literally frying those nymphs on the leaves. Um, Prior to that, in I think it was 2010 and 11, we had very mild summers and some really moister weather and citricola scale was a problem back then and I was getting lots of calls and having lots of discussions and doing field days and then our, our climate shifted to hotter, drier and we have not seen as much citricola scale since. It's still out there, it's still problematic in some orchards, but it's not as severe as it was in those years. So let's talk sampling. I really focus you as much as possible on sampling the first instar nymphs, because again, they're on the outside of the tree, they're on the leaves, uh, they're small, they're the stage that's most easy to kill with most insecticides. So what you do is you walk up to the tree and you reach just inside, not too deep, just inside in the leaves that are in a little bit of shade. You choose fully expanded leaves. 
you collect one leaf per tree and progress down the road till you have a group of 25 leaves. And then you count the number of scales per leaf. Um, so you total the number of scales you found and divide by 25 for that row. Or you can count the number of infested leaves. We can do a presence absence sampling either way. And you repeat this procedure in four evenly spaced rows in the orchard. And that should give you a really good idea of what's going on in the orchard. So here's a couple of examples of presence absence sampling. I mean, I think uh, scales per leaf is pretty straightforward and the threshold is 0.5 scales per leaf. Um, but the presence absence sampling may not be familiar to you. So what I basically came up with was this sort of, if, if you have a 25 leaf sample and four or fewer leaves are infested with scales, uh, it's a no, no, no problem. No, don't bother to spray that orchard. So in site one, two out of the 25 leaves had scale in one row, one out of the 25 leaves had scale in another row, and the other two rows had no scale whatsoever. So that's a site where I would say a spray is not needed. You're not at a treatment threshold. Site two is very obviously uh, highly infested. 14 out of the 25 leaves had some scale on them that was alive. 15 in another row, 24 in another row, and 22 in another row is very obviously a yes. And then you get to some sites where should I treat or shouldn't I treat? It's kind of borderline. One row was over the threshold of 12 infested leaves. One row had sort of in-betweener and two rows was were no. I would say go ahead and spray because um, they can produce so many crawlers and the population can get out of hand within a year. So that's probably, that's definitely a block. If any one of the four rows has a problem, I would say spray the whole orchard. And then site four is a little more uh, iffy. Um, depending on what you're treating with, you might want to treat that one as well. So there are going to be some clear cases and there are going to be some cases that are kind of iffy and you have to make a decision based on your experience with that orchard and the insecticides that you're choosing to use to treat with. So I think now, um, Peter, we're ready for the first set of quiz questions. If you want to pop those up there. The first question is, how many times does a citricola scale molt? A is one time, B is two times, C is three times. Go ahead and put in your answers. And while they're um, answering, I have a question that has come into the Q and A. Okay. Um, is there a, is there a side of the tree that the scale are more likely to be? Uh, for example, northeast versus southwest. Yeah, I forgot to mention that when I was lecturing, but you the northeast is definitely the preferred side of the tree, so that is where you should always do your sampling just to standardize it. Okay, 73% of you are correct. They molt two times, once between the first and second instar and once between the second instar and the adult. Okay, next question. Okay, here's our okay. second question. During what months should you sample the adult female scales on twigs? Is it A, January to February, B, April to May, C, July to August, or D, September to August? And here's another question that came in for you. Um, do you think the cold spring this year will help citricola scale rebound in the coming year? I think what it will do is allow a lot of females to survive and lay a lot of eggs. Those eggs will hatch mostly in May, June, July. If our weather shifts and we get into that prolonged heat again, then I think a lot of those nymphs will die. So it all depends on what happens with the weather in the next four months. Now we see them. Okay. 53% of you are correct. You would be sampling the adult females in the April-May period. So right about now. Next question. There we go. Next question. How many eggs does a citricola scale female produce? A, 10, B, 100, C, 1,000, D, 10,000. And then just a comment that came in um, says, I found that watching for first in star citricola scale on new fruit during monitoring for citrus thrips is helpful. 
good point. Yep, they're on the move around petal fall time. 84% of you are correct. They lay about a thousand eggs. Next question. What months are best for sampling the first instar nymphs on the leaves? March through April, May through June, July through August, September through October. And then another question that's come in. Um, are citricola scales affected by the same California red scale mating disruption pheromone? Nope, they're completely different animals. And even if they were, they can't because there are no males. So mating disruption disrupts males from finding females. And since we don't have males, you can't use mating disruption on citricola scale. We'll have to come up with some other control method. 57% of you are correct. July through August is the point in time when you want to be looking for those first instar nymphs. It's too early right now. Okay, next slide. Next question, I mean. There we go. What spring weather conditions make citricola scale a big problem? A, cool and wet, or B, hot and dry? There was a question that came in, and I think you might have covered this, but I'll um, ask again here. Are the colors depicted consistent as opposed to variable colors? So is color not a reliable characteristic? Uh, not quite sure what they mean by color. The, the animal itself looks really different than in like a red scale as an adult or a second instar. As a first instar, the crawlers can look kind of like red scale crawlers, but they're bigger. They're generally yellow, so the color is normal, but you have to look for them with a hand lens. And so, yeah, I'm not sure if they meant color when they're dying or, the pictures I showed are pretty characteristic. Yeah. Okay, 96 percent of you are on track. Cool and wet is when citricola scale are a big problem. Next, uh, I think we're done with the questions because that was the fifth one, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. So back to me. Okay. So let's talk biological control for a couple minutes. There are a number of different parasites that will lay their eggs in a citricola scale. The little parasitic wasp in the upper right is called Metaphycus helvellus, and it lays its egg underneath the um, second instars generally. In, in the upper left there, number one, you can, there's an egg laid under the edge of the scale. In number two, that egg hatches into a parasite larva. In number three, it pupates and looks like this clear pupa. And then in four, the adult would chew a hole and climb out. So this particular set of scales had actually multiple um, parasites attacking it. What you usually see in the field is something like the picture shown just below the parasitic wasp where the, the scale looks kind of brown. The ones on the left were from a laboratory colony, so I don't think they look quite as typical. But the one on the right is a typical um, parasitized scale. So let's go on to the other parasite. There's one called Cacophagus lacimnia, and it, its parasitism looks a little different, but it's doing a similar thing. It's a really beautiful parasite, black with a little yellow area on its thorax. And they lay their egg inside the, the um, second instar, and that egg hatches into a larva, and there you see one peeled back so you can see the larva, and then they pupate, and then they emerge. So again, they're attacking and parasitizing these citricola scales. Now, we have a problem though. Biological control struggles in the San Joaquin Valley because the parasites like to lay their eggs in scales that are more than 1.3 millimeters in size. So we have periods of time in this valley where the scales are too small. They're all first instars in June, July, August, partway into September, October, it isn't until November that they're finally big enough for the parasites to lay their eggs in them. If they lay them in a small scale, the parasite can't really complete development. And so it's just, it's just not viable. Um, so those scale stages are only available about six months of the year. That makes biocontrol really hard to be accomplished. 
And there are alternative hosts for these parasites, uh, brown soft scale, black scale, which might be found in olives. But there's not a lot of these alternative hosts here in the San Joaquin Valley. Down in Southern California, those are more common. And we also see, probably because the temperatures are more uniform, we see almost, almost multiple generations in Southern California. So for some reason, you cannot find Citricola scale in Southern California very easily, but it's very common up here. So just that weather difference is enough to make it um, a really different situation. So that's why we can't rely on biological control. It just can't get going. It just barely gets going in April, May, and then uh, there's nothing for them to lay eggs in and the parasites die off. So traditionally, uh, for many, many years, Lorsban was probably the most commonly used insecticide because it worked really, really well and it had kind of a fumigant effect and you could spray the orchard and, and you would get red scale and you, you could spray the orchard and get other pests and you would get citricola scale at the same time. But very recently, uh, Lorsban is no longer registered for use in citrus and so it's, it's just not available. But it got the growers into the routine of you spray when the first instar nymphs have are on the leaves and the crawlers the eggs have all hatched and they've all moved out there and and so spraying in july august sometimes into september is the best time to control the scales we did some bioassaying to determine if any of the citricola scale populations in the San Joaquin Valley have developed resistance to lores ban. And how we do that is we collect infested leaves and we circle the nymphs, the live ones on the leaf, and we dip the leaves for a few seconds in a discriminating concentration of lores ban known as chlorpyrifos. And then we let them dry and then we put them on these moist cotton pads and we put stick them around them and a cotton barrier. And then we wait five days to see if they can, um, see if they're alive or dead because it's kind of hard to tell something that doesn't move around if it's alive or not. So we wait until they dry out a little bit and then we can tell who's alive and who's dead. And we did a lot of this resistance monitoring in the early 2000s and saw a lot of populations. What this graph shows is their survival of that concentration and each line is a different orchard population. And what we found was about 40% of the populations survive, more than 20% of the scales on that leaf survive that concentration of chlorpyrifos. So that tells me that 40% of the populations have some organophosphate resistance which is not surprising because organophosphates have been used for more than 50 years in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, first parathion and then superside and dimethoate and, and lorsban. So there's been a lot of organophosphate usage. So in, in actuality, citricola scale develops resistance fairly slowly relative to other pests. Citrus thrips develop resistance to the organophosphates in the 1980s, California red scale in the 1990s, and citricola scale it took till the 2000s. So they don't develop resistance very fast, which is good, um, because we really don't have a lot of chemical groups, different modes of action to use to control them. Uh, since the OP resistance and carbamates usually have cross resistance, so really 7 and malathion don't really help us out a whole lot, even though we've lost Lorsban. Um, the only other chemical groups available for managing uh, citricola scale are the neonicotinoids, like Acale, Ectara, Platinum, Systemic Admire, and their generics, uh, the butenolides, Savanto, the IGR, Centaur, and straight oil. So those, those are the options. Um, for resistance management purposes, it's really important that you just don't keep spraying the citricola scale with the same compound, the same group over and over again. So I could show you lots and lots of data. We've done literally dozens, if not hundreds, of citricola scale trials to see what works best in what time of year, which chemicals work on the females on twigs, which work on the instar, first instars on leaves, um, how do they work relative to each other, and I'll, I'll just go through these and, and tell you about it. 
So the one product that seems to work well on the females on twigs is a sale. Um, I think you should avoid treating in the spring for a number of reasons. All of these products are pretty broad spectrum. And so you're going to knock out natural enemies. Uh, you're getting close to bloom when you've got females on there and you can't be spraying a sale during bloom. So you've got a lot of issues that would, that would make it difficult to utilize that product. But if you were in a desperate situation where the scales got missed the previous year and they're, you're seeing huge females and large numbers of them and you've got to get on top of the population, I can see why you would want to treat in the sp early spring. Most of the chemicals are better applied if you apply them to first instars on leaves during that July, August period. And that includes the Asale, Ectar, Savanto, and Centaur. You can use systemic imidacloprid, probably best use of that is in June, um, but or platinum, but the systemics do not work as well as the foliar treatments for citricola scale. So just know that, that, it, that if you have a serious population, you really should put a foliar on. And the Neonix and Savanto work better than Centaur in terms of the number of scale that they will kill in a single application. Uh, Centaur affects molting. They, they don't molt very often. And so it's just not as strong a material as the Neonix and the Butenolide. Oil, straight oil is used by organic growers because that's their only option. And it takes multiple treatments and it's kind of hard on the tree. So um, it's just, it's, and it doesn't, it only kills the ones that it makes direct contact with. There's no residual. So again, on a sliding scale, it's more difficult to control citricol scale with oil than it is some of these other products. So best management practices for treating for citricola scale are treat as soon as the eggs have completely hatched and the crawlers have moved out onto the leaves. Coverage is critical because the insecticide must contact the insects, slow down the speed of the rig to get better coverage. Generally, you only need like 300 to 500 gallons per acre, but you should drive slowly in order to get that coverage. Uh, you can use adjuvants to improve coverage, such as oil, and in order of what works the best in terms of killing the most numbers of scale. I would say a sale and a Savanto are better than Actara Centaur, and those are better than Admire systemically applied or oil. Uh, low populations are well controlled by just about anything. So any of those products works well if you're keeping the population managed. Now, one thing we need to be concerned about is when you're applying these insecticides, what impact is it going to have on some of the other natural enemies, such as a Phytus malinus, which is needed for red scale control. So over the years, we've done what we call this type of uh, this jar bioassay, where we take foliage that was treated in the field and we put it into jars uh, once a week for 10 weeks or more after a treatment has been applied to see how long it kills a phytus adults and then we just get a phytus from insectaries and put them in those jars and then wait 24 hours to see whether they live or die. And you can see on this graph that the black line is water, the purple line is centaur. So those two products are relatively non-toxic to the phytus wasps. Uh, they have literal or no impact. Whereas the Lord's Ban, Actar, and Savanto kill almost all of the aphytis for up six to eight weeks. So I would call those broad spectrum insecticides. So there's trade-offs here. Depending on how serious the citricola scale population is, you might wanna, if it's low, you might wanna lean towards the centaur so that you get more survival of the natural enemies. Um, but if it's a higher population, you can't risk not controlling the citricola scale. And so you're gonna have to make a trade-off in losing some of the natural enemies. So my take home messages for citricola scale control are, it's a numbers game. Don't let the populations get large before you begin to take care of them. Timing for nymphs is late July, August. Nymphs are easier to kill than adults for most insecticides. Timing for the adults is just prior to bloom. Your coverage, no matter what the water volume, and you can, as I said, you can use somewhere between 300 and 500 gallons per acre, and that should be sufficient depending on the size of the trees to um, 
to get contact the leaves on the tree and get those first instars. But the most important thing is to drive slowly because all of the newer insecticides require contact with the insect. They don't have the fumigant effect that Lorsban had. And so if you miss the scales, um, you're not going to kill them because they're just sitting there. And if you missed them, you missed them. Centaur and oil are the only insecticides soft on natural enemies. Adjuvants improve efficacy for most of these insecticides and don't keep using the same insecticide class or you will select for resistance eventually. Okay, so we're ready for our second set of quiz questions. Um, oh, I have to show this. Which scale is the healthy live one, image A or image B? Do we have any other questions, Cheryl, or are we good for the moment? Uh, I think we're okay for the moment. Okay, 98% of you are correct. Image A is the healthy one. Clear, yellowish, not dried out. Next question. What stage of Citricola scale is the most easily killed by pesticides? The first instar, the second instar, or the adult female? 79% of you are correct. The first instar stage is most easily killed by pesticides. Small, translucent, soft. The cuticle isn't hardened up yet, and so the pesticides can penetrate. Next question. Which insecticide is the softest one of this group on natural enemies such as Aphytus wasps? The Savanto, the Assail, the Applaud, or the Actara? Actually, Applaud, that's an old name in there. I should have changed that to Centaur. So C should say Centaur. And there is a question I'll ask you right now. Um, does the October timing of Octera for Fuller Rose Beetle affect the resistance issue of Citricola? That's a good question. I'm not too worried about resistance in Citricola because it develops it so slowly. But yes, if that's being done year in and year out and some orchards are receiving two Actara treatments per year, that could potentially select for resistance. On the positive side, it could be part of the reason that people are not seeing as much Citricola scale as they were a few years back is because of those treatments that are being put in for the fuller rose beetle. Good point to bring up. Okay, 71% of you are correct. It's the applaud or the centaur that is the soft chemical out of that group. Next slide. Question nine, which group of insecticides have San Joaquin Valley citricola scale populations developed resistance to? The neonicotinoids, the insect growth regulators, the oils, or the organophosphates? Which group have they developed some resistance to? And a question for you. Uh, what class of oil is used? These are petroleum oils I'm thinking of, but I think you could use any type of oil. 440, 415, 455, whatever, organic, non-organic. Uh, it doesn't really matter which oil you use. It's more the technique of applying it at a high enough concentration that you kill the scales. And not having done a lot of that work, I can't really tell you what that percentage is, but it's probably in the 1% range, not the half percent range. You gotta get a pretty good concentration. And some people do a much higher concentration in the spring uh, when the trees can tolerate it. It would be best to talk to an organic grower how they utilize straight oil. When it's applied as an adjuvant, a half percent is plenty. There we go. 82% uh, of you are correct. It's the organophosphates that they have developed the resistance to. Um, it hasn't happened for the rest of the groups yet. Uh, next question. Why don't we have good biological control of citricola scale in the San Joaquin Valley? Is it A, because there are no parasites? Is it B, because growers spray too much? Or is it C, because the scales are too small during much of the year? 
And a question um, while they're answering this poll, um, how much do ants disrupt biological control? Ants are always a problem. They farm insects for their honeydew. And since these produce honeydew, they're gonna wanna protect them. We don't see as much ant activity up here as they do in Southern California, but it can be serious. And so ants need to be controlled, otherwise you're, you're not gonna get good biological control. There's a quick follow-up to that one too. Um, do the ants also disrupt biocontrol for red scale? They do, even though red scale don't produce honeydew, they also will stand over scales. I've seen them, I have video of them, standing over the red scales and then attacking any parasites that try and come close to them. So there's something instinctual there that, and they're not even a honeydew producing insect. So 84% of you are correct. The scales are just too small during much of the year. Although it's true that growers can spray too much and kill off the natural enemies. Um, it is not true that there are no parasites. I've seen them here in the San Joaquin Valley. They are attacking the citricola scale. They are out there. They're trying to do their best, but um, they, just, they just really struggle here. Okay, that's it for the questions, uh, the quiz questions. Now, are there any additional questions, Cheryl, in the chat? Yeah, there are a few. Um, so I think there's about four. So the first one, are all adult scale species such as brown scales and others, are their appearance affected by oil treatments in a way that makes diagnosing dead scales difficult? Hmm, I hadn't thought about that question. It's the first in stars that get that puffed up look. The adults and other stages don't get that puffed up look. Um, so if you want to avoid having to make that decision, you just wait three or four weeks to look at the scales. And by then, anything that was puffed up by oil has probably crisped up and dried out and it will be very obvious if they're alive or dead. But I would think that you would see the same thing in a first in star brown soft scale that you see in a citricola scale. And that's a subject I didn't discuss at all. Some orchards have brown soft scale, but that's pretty rare in the San Joaquin Valley. Usually brown soft scale is a problem in backyard citrus. And it has multiple generations per year and the parasites do well on it because it always has some young instars available for them to attack. Okay, uh, the next one, are there predatory insect species which have some effectiveness against citricola scale crawlers? Uh, more than likely, yes. Uh, lace wings, I would imagine. Even lady beetles would probably be interested. Possibly syrphids. So I can think of lots of generalists, but I've seen populations of citricola scale that were quite large that were not being managed by generalist predators. So I, it's a, it's a numbers game. Okay, uh, is it possible to develop resistance to oil? I don't think so because it's pretty much a smothering agent. So that is one that I think it would be really difficult for an insect to develop resistance to it. They would have to come up with some kind of barrier in their cuticle that makes it harder for the oil to penetrate or, yeah, it's just, it, it would be really difficult. Okay, um, are any predators effective against the scales? I haven't studied that, so I can't really answer that question. I think there are many that are active, but probably not at the level that we need that is, would keep them below an economic threshold. So we're trying to keep the number of citricola scale nymphs per leaf to fewer than 0.5. That's a really low threshold. Uh, if the threshold were much higher, then we could probably rely more on biological control. But because it's a very low threshold before yield starts to be affected, then you, you just can't allow those large populations to go. And you'll see that in, Orchards where citricola scale is not managed well, the trees become thin, the yield is much, much lower, and it, it has, it has long-term effects on the tree. 
Okay, we've had a few more coming in. So um, the next one, would Thrips treatment after petal fall also control citricola scale? Depends on what chemical is used. Um, the problem with Thrips treatments after petal fall, it would have to be usually petal falls around May 1st. And as I said, the, the first instars don't fully, the crawlers don't fully emerge until towards the end of July. Usually Thrips treatments are already done by then. If a Thrips treatment happened to be that late, then I would say, yes, it would have an impact. And, and you know, yeah, Thrips treatment in June would get some of the crawlers emerging out, but it's not gonna get as many. You're gonna do a more effective job if you apply a treatment specifically for citricola scale. Okay, uh, the next one is how frequently do the different scales coexist or overlap? Um, I tend to see either citricola scale or red scale dominate an orchard. And part of that's weather because as I said, the red scales are gonna dominate when the weather is hot and dry and the citricola when it's cool and wet. So they sort of trade off. You can have both scales in an orchard at the same time, but usually one dominates. Okay, the next one, how do scales move from tree to tree and are they fast movers? Oh, good question, which we didn't address. They're gonna get, there's only one stage that's gonna get them from tree to tree and that's the crawlers. And when the crawlers are moving out in the early spring, they're probably, some of them are blown by wind. They could probably um, latch onto insects or other flying organisms such as birds and be carried that way. They can probably crawl from tree to tree, but that would be a really long distance for them. Uh, I think most of it, it's being carried in the wind. Okay. Um, are mandarins more tolerant to citricola damage? I have no idea. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know that citricola kind of builds up in orchards over time and mandarins are f a fairly young crop. And so we're just starting to do some of those sorts of studies. Jay Rosenheim's group out of UC Davis has been looking at thrips and earwigs and katydids and seen a huge difference in various mandarin groups as to their susceptibility to those pests. We haven't really looked at citricola scale yet, but it's possible. They could be more or less susceptible. Okay, the next one. Um, part of the reason for slow resistance development of citricola scale populations is not there every year for exposure. Is that true? I'm not sure what they mean, whether they mean that you don't treat for them every year. Um, for a long time, organophosphates were applied for thrips, scales, and citricola scale, or the combination thereof. And so even though those chemicals were stopped being used for thrips and scale, they continue to be used for citricola scale. So you can't look at it as, oh, I only spray for citricola every other year. If you're spraying for fuller rose beetle, you're applying a neonic. If you're spraying for Asian citrusillid, you're applying a neonic. You know, you, you may be applying a selection pressure that's more than once every other year. It might be every year or multiple times a year. So you could, have quite a selection pressure going on there. Okay, and then there was just, I think there's a, I think, okay. Thrips treatment are often low volume of water and outside coverage. And that was a comment, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, that probably relates yeah. to the question as to whether a thrips treatment would take care of a citricola scale. I don't think it would ever take care of it for that reason as well as the timing issue. You're not applying enough water volume to get good enough coverage of the leaves. I think it, it could help if it happens to be a chemical that, that it works on citricola scale. Yeah, it could help, but it's not gonna get the population the same way as a really good application of 300 to 500 gallons, which is more thorough coverage um, would get. 
Okay, and then um, just a comment, um, 415 oil is easier on the tree, but 440 oil may be more effective. I would agree with that. Uh, 440 is, is better on insects. I think in the old days, there was a lot of danger in 440 because there were um, sulfonated residues in, in the, but they've managed to decrease those um, quite a bit and, and the newer products are much more purified. And so I think there's less danger of that kind of um, phytotoxicity to the trees with the, with the heavier weight oils. You just have to make sure that your trees are very well irrigated and you're not applying them in the heat of the day. And that is all. Okay, I don't see anything else coming in. So um, thank you, Beth, is, for presenting. There is just oh. one comment in the chat uh, that um, one laboratory is raising Lindorus rhizobius. That is a good scale predator. Do you have experience with that, Beth? Yes, Rhizobius is a good scale predator. Um, I haven't seen as much of it in recent years, possibly because of all the use of neonics in all the orchards these days. But um, yes, that is a good predator for, for scales and, and in general. Okay, so I think that's all for questions. I don't see anything else in the chat or in Q&A. All right, so thank you again, Beth. You're welcome. And uh, thank you everybody for attending and uh, we'll hope you'll return to our next one next month on May 20th. Thank you very much. This was fun.